afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, welcome to today's um, session. Um, my name is Gitu Kungene, and I am a senior advisor um, for youth employment and innovation with Masiko. Um, and I'm incredibly excited to be with you here today um, to invite you for today's session, which is part of the 12th uh, Global Sankalp Summit, um, which is the virtual impact week. Um, a really exciting, um, you know, event all together and really a testament of the times that we are living in right now. Um, I know for a fair number of you who may have been at past uh, Sankalp sessions, you know, uh, we've had physical sessions, uh, but in the light of the pandemic, you know, really trying to, you know, move with the times and, you know, transition um, this type um, of gatherings and, you know, uh, get togethers into um, virtual events, which is a great, um, you know, opportunity for us as it really allows us to, you know, um, also rope in um, a wider audience and, you know, um, allow us to, you know, interact with um, peers and, you know, colleagues from across the world. So this is really exciting for us um, and, um, and really, you know, thankful and grateful to the audience for um, joining us this morning. Um, I'd like to start by, you know, thanking the organizers for this, uh, that's um, in Telecap um, and the Suncalp Forum in general um, for putting together such a stellar event. I'd also like to, you know, thank um, the audience uh, for joining uh, today's event um, and also to really thank, you know, our excellent panel of experts who I will be introducing later on to the session. Um, for really, you know, investing their time and their resources um, to go through, you know, today's session with us. Um, and, and, and once again, you know, um, for those who are just joining us now, um, this is the, this is the, this, sorry, for, for, those of, for those of you who are just joining us, this is the session on um, safety nets um, and, you know, we'll be discussing about building resilience for gig workers um, in emerging markets and really, you know, digging into this really um, exciting conversation um, around uh, the gig economy and, you know, how we see this panning out and, you know, really um, thinking about, um, you know, safety nets um, and resilience for gig workers. Um, allow me uh, to begin by introducing Masico, um, the organization that I represent. Uh, Masico is a global organization working in over 41 countries across the world. Um, we bring innovation, in, innovative solutions to some of the um, world's most pressing challenges, um, you know, cutting across themes like, um, you know, agri, agri, agri business and uh, food security, um, youth employment, uh, climate change, uh, disaster, natural disasters and relief, um, among a broad um, range of other themes. Um, and, 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 and this is a really exciting uh, topic uh, for us here at Masico when we think about, you know, safety nets and the gig economy, as it really, you know, aligns to our work around youth employment um, and, you know, worker resilience. And um, we are building this off um, a flagship initiative here at Masico uh, that we've had for the last uh, three years, you know, Youth Impact Labs, which is a program that we've been running in collaboration with um, google.org. Um, um, and through Youth Impact Labs, we've been, you know, uh, working with um, partners across um, Africa and the Middle East to, you know, foster in innovation and leverage technology to address um, youth employment. And um, over, over, over this period, we've really worked with, you know, um, tech platforms um, across, you know, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, Jordan, Syria, um, to really, you know, identify ways in which technology can, you know, uh, be tapped to drive, um, you know, um, job creation at scale and particularly address um, you know, the youth and employment uh, problem. And in the midst of this, the gig economy has been one such frontier where we see significant opportunity, but also, you know, a significant load of work that um, needs to be, um, you know, done by different stakeholders in the ecosystem to really set up this as a solution um, for, you know, the employment question um, on the continent and really mirroring 
um, other parts of the world uh, where we are seeing you know this this happening and so um to just quickly set the stage for us um you know this 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 morning and this evening or this afternoon depending on where you are um you know um we we do recognize you know that the world is rapidly changing um and you know uh, some of the problems that we see um around youth employment and you know um access to jobs um are you know really um a very hard reality in the you know in the in the in the in the places that we work so for us who are based here in sub sahara you know we do see that you know um in africa alone we you know over 50% of young people um are experiencing long term unemployment um and even for those who are in employment um you know uh, across africa over 80% of them are working in the informal sector uh particularly here in Kenya where you know I'm currently based um we're looking at over 90% of you know the labor markets are being centered um in in the informal sector uh but we also see you know interesting trends around the digital economy we have seen steady growth you know uh both globally and even in you know some of the markets that we work in um you know a recent study by the oxford economics um by oxford economics valued the digital economy at about 11.5 trillion dollars that's about 15.5% of the global gdp and um you know this you know is attributable to the fact that you know the digital economy has grown 2.5 times faster um than the global gdp over the last 15 years um we also see um you know like a gross volume of about 455 billion us dollars um being projected on the gig economy by 2023 and this does speak a lot to you know um a trend that's you know very um uniform and very uh synonymous across the entire world but even more exciting is you know the opportunity that the gig economy presents to um some of these emerging markets like Kenya Ethiopia India um Jordan where we do see you know a massive opportunity to transition um this economy into you know this a lot of these formal workers into you know a formal you know well profiled workforce um and we are seeing platforms emerging really driving you know this agenda and really speaking to you know um the transformative uh potential uh that could be seen out of the gig economy and so um this 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 is interesting uh but also in the wake of covid-19 really seeing you know some of the challenges uh that come with the gig economy as a as a as a set and as an ecosystem um particularly you know uh bringing out the challenge around you know uh, the lack of social protection uh for gig workers and really um you know exposing and aggravating the vulnerability of workers in this sector and and this has you know sort of you know reinforced a conversation that we as Masico have been having over the last one year around safety nets and asking ourselves that you know as the workforce transitions to you know a more flexible format of work how do we then ensure that we are leveraging and we are tapping into the opportunity that the gig economy presents while ensuring that you know workers still remain secure that they are protected from you know the shocks um you know financial and social economic shocks um and you know and that we ensure that you know they still have stable and decent lives and so that's the topic that we plan to dive into um this this, this today and um for this uh, i am joined by uh, a panel of experts um who i will be introducing to you um and you know um coming um from kenya but also from other parts of the world um and really you know focusing on um on 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 this subject uh within different parts of the economy or rather of the world and um to 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 start us off i'll start by introducing our panel um we have um akini uh, oko who's the operations director at uh, link uh, link is a link is a digital platform that connects blue collar workers to job opportunities in kenya and has been a great partner of masico um under the youth impact labs program um great to have you on the session today akini um we have shiko gitao who's uh, the ceo of kala 
um, Kala is a platform based out of Nairobi that has been um, looking into the gig economy and you know looking into the opportunities um, that the gig economy presents, as well as really thinking around how we can um, innovate products and structures for the gig economy. And recently, um, Shiko and her team, you know, introduced a new uh, platform called Pax, which I believe she should be talking about later on, um, that seeks to address this question around safety nets. So thank you so much, Shiko, for being part of today's conversation. Um, last but not least, um, we have Ashley Arons. Um, Ashley Arons is my um, colleague here at Masico and, you know, an expert around um, worker resilience and market systems and has been supporting a lot of Masico's work across the world um, and will be speaking to, um, you know, our experiences working with platforms and, you know, with um, gig workers across the Masico portfolio. I'd also like to recognize uh, the presence of Tatenda Furusa, who's the CEO of Imalipay. Imalipay is um, a recently launched platform in Kenya, um, Uganda, um, and, um, and Nigeria that, that is looking into insurance and financial products for gig workers, and we will be hearing from him at some point during our session. So thank you very much, everyone, um, for joining today's session. And without much further ado, I'll invite our panelists um, to really share their insights and their perspectives around this subject with us. And um, I'll start us off by, you know, just having yourselves tell us more about your organizations and the work you do and how that relates um, to, you know, the, today's theme around, you know, safety nets and the resilience of gig workers. And I think to kick us off, you know, it will be great to have your Kini, you know, um, of course, working with um, a platform that is doing this kind of work to tell us about, um, about Link and your work there and, you know, how it relates to the subject today. So, um, off to your Kenya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tuku. And hello to everyone, wherever you're dialing in from. It's quite rainy. I'm just looking outside of the skies here. So I hope everyone is safe and well. Um, so as Bituku had shared, Link is a technology platform that connects informal sector workers to households and businesses across Nairobi. So we work across three major sectors, beauty and wellness, furniture and decor, and installation and repair and maintenance. So the workers that come to our platform, again, are informal workers. Some of them are skilled in their um, based off experience. Um, a number of them are also skilled based off certification. So we engage with different types of workers at different skill levels on our platform. We also have something that's quite unique in our platform beyond these workers that we engage with on a regular basis that we would consider by the definition of a gig platform um, freelancers. We also have workers in our apprenticeship program, uh, specifically in our furniture sector where we incubate about 30 workers and these workers are under apprenticeship. They get on the job type of training, constant mentorship and support, access to tools and materials, and really a very clear path for them to be able to graduate off our platform and be able to be their own business owners. Um, so we've been working in this space for a little bit of time since 2015. Um, we service three different types of clients, households, businesses, and we also do large projects. So I'll just pause there and hand it over to Gituko and be back to speak shortly. Great, thank you so much, Akinye. Uh, Shiko. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, sorry, my, my voice is a bit husky. I've been under the weather this, this past week. Um, so my name is Dr. Shiko Kitao. I'm the CEO of Kala. Uh, just a correction. So Kala is a digital innovation lab uh, based in Nairobi. Our work, we have to, uh, Two prong approach to digital innovation. The first one is we work with um, large or co corporates and organizations to help them build digital and innovation capabilities within the, within the organizations. And for some of them, we are their skunk work. So we basically help them like build stuff. We have a team of data scientists, engineers, UX people who we go and solve problems with our with with, with these organizations and then leave capabilities within there. So we. How we actually help them like find the right teams and create the right teams for them. 
On the other hand, we have a, a venture lab uh, within the, the the organization where we build products. We always say we can't be we cannot be selling porridge only. We have to be taking our own porridge. So, in the in the spirit of taking our own porridge, we actually build products. Uh, we we have a couple of products. We actually just launched one last week. Jukua Juku is an SME. Uh, b2b marketplace uh to help like sme and msmes become more productive um and then we have parks which i'll talk about uh much later so those that that, that is what uh Jukua is and we work with a large organization we've been during covid we've been supporting the government of kenya through the minister of ict and ministry of health in in modeling and data analysis for for the covid pand pandemic and then we we work with smaller startups in helping them like uh, ideate and bring some of those ideas to life. We have people who, who want to start up a, a small startup and they are still in corporate. So we work with them to be, bring it to life and have a proof of concept that they can quit their main job to make this their main hustle. So that's, that's, that's how we work. And then of course we have our own products that we are hoping to, to spin off at some point. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Hiko. And I think we shall be diving into some of those products that you mentioned, because um, I believe they really speak to, you know, the issue around soft safety nets and, you know, gig worker resilience. Ashley, um, yeah, uh, please introduce yourself and tell us more about your, you know, work with Masico. Uh, well, hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Aarons. It's a real pleasure to be here and get to thanks to organize this and, and to Sankal. I'll apologize as well. I'm, I'm a bit, I have a bit of a cold today, so. Um, hopefully I won't be coughing too much. Uh, so I'm a senior advisor at Mercy Corps uh, with a focus on employment. Uh, Mercy Corps is a large international NGO with, with programs around, around much of the world. Tuk has already, already mentioned a little bit. Um, my focus on employment uh, is essentially giving advice to our different programs around the world, focusing around both wage employment, self-employment, thinking about labor supply, the different aspects of the labor system really with a goal around our programs focus on um, improving incomes, improving quality of work. And an important part is improving the resilience of, of, of workers, which we'll be talking about a bit later, uh, but definitely very pertinent here. Um, probably our particular areas of focus we're trying to move is try to support, try to take what we call a systems approach. So rather than just providing direct support to workers, improving the ecosystem sustainably around them, which is how probably why we're here and speaking to a number of you, those kind of other people here, those key actors. Also a big push around supporting technology to improve employment. And uh, Gituk has talked about our Youth Impact Labs program. I think later on I'll, I'll mention some of our, our, our work in other, other areas. Um, but as an example, we also manage an online mentoring platform called MicroMentor. And I, I don't know if this counts as eating our own porridge, but we also have our own um, investment platform that has invested a number of startup um, technology focused platforms around, around Africa. Great, thank you so much, Ashley. Um, awesome, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off, you know, with, with the first question, which I'll direct to Akini. Um, now, you know, with, with, the, with, with the pandemic, you know, um, hitting Africa, you know, earlier this year, we did see, you know, some significant disruption, you know, across entire economies, um, and COVID really did have, you know, very um, varied effects uh, to different, you know, parts of uh, the world and, you know, different um, parts of workers. And, you know, could you just, you know, kick us off by sharing with us, you know, um, what this meant for a platform like Link, and, you know, how how did, you know, Link or rather, what are why the implications of COVID-19 on link workers? And, um, you know, how did you see, how did link really, you know, adapt itself to what we saw? Oh, sure thing. So in terms of the implications of COVID on workers on our platform, let me take a step back to reiterate that we only work with informal sector workers. Yeah, and so we don't have the option of working from home. You know, your plumber can't WhatsApp you and tell you you can fix the drainage pipe here, at least not in this market. So the biggest disruptor to being able to deliver these services is the fact that we must deliver these services face to face. And so related to that, I would say rela um, related to that in this pandemic, the biggest disruption has been in terms of income. Yeah, in terms of volume of jobs on the platform and jobs on the platform. 
platform to kind of give you a sensibility of this. Prior to COVID, as Link, we were able to provide guarantees to the workers on our platform in terms of the average number of jobs we were sending them in a month. As a result of COVID, this was pretty much thrown outside of the window. Within the first month of COVID itself, we had a decrease in um, demand on our platform. So again, we work across households and across businesses. On the household front, we saw a decrease by 37%. On the business um, side, we saw a decrease by 90%. So very, very drastic decreases in demand on the platform, um, resulting in inability to essentially be able to plan your life accordingly. Um, but having uncertainties in terms of if you're going to get income or not from the platform. Yeah, in very drastic cases, there were um, instances where we had to discontinue services in and of itself. So workers were not only having disruptions in terms of the volume of jobs on the platform, but no job connections and linkages at all. So for instance, in the case of cleaning, this is something that we were able to do, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. This was something we were able to do up until I would say June, July, and it's a service that we had to discontinue just because there was no demand. Um, related to this disruption in terms of incomes and in terms of volume of work, I would say is also exposure to the virus. Yeah, so again, your beautician, your plumber, your electrician does not have a way to be able to deliver these services remotely. They have to have face-to-face -face interactions to sell their goods, to sell their services. And so, you know, the points of interactions are many by the time the worker is commuting from their place of residence to engage with that client, not only to engage with the clients, but for instance, to pick up supplies. So really exposure to the virus. I would say the third thing is related to the increased cost of production. So not only were we seeing this drastic demand in services on the platform, but the cost of actually doing work increased. Yeah, your transport costs increase, your input and operational costs increase. So it's not costing you more to buy this type of tool or to buy this type of consumable. And then the last thing, and I think this is um, link specific, but is also um, quite common in a lot of gig platforms that provide additional incubation type of subsets. We had quite a big incubation program before COVID that we were incub incubating about 70 workers across those three segments, beauty, furniture, and installation repair and maintenance. These workers that were under apprentice, again, were getting on the job training, were getting mentorship, access to tools and materials. They were also salaried. They also had access to social protections that other workers on our platform didn't have. So for instance, when we started this apprenticeship program, one of the things that we needed to do was make sure all of our um, professionals were compliant, had registered for their carry pins, had access to NHIF, which is our national health fund, had access to NSSF, which is our national social protection fund, and this, these were essentially all taken away because of COVID. Um, we had to discontinue this apprenticeship program and rapidly graduate. I use that term very lightly because they had not finished their apprenticeship, but essentially shift them into this distributed model where we didn't know that demand. We weren't able to guarantee them the um, volume of jobs that we would in this apprenticeship type model. So in terms sure. of the interventions very quickly, just the interventions just, we took were also... Okay. J sure. Just before we go into the interventions, could you, yeah. you know, like, I, I think from a platform's perspective, you know, you really yeah. painted a picture of what this meant in terms of, you know, um, you couldn't guarantee incomes anymore, you couldn't guarantee mm -hmm. jobs. Um, how did how did these workers cope? Like, what are some of the coping strategies that you saw um, the workers taking on? Uh, did you see any adaptations, any transitions into other types of jobs? Um, did you see any negative coping strategies? Um, is that something that you can talk to too? Yes. So in terms of workers' reaction, um, this depends on the type of worker. Um, so again, with our apprenticeship, the impact and the blow was quite hard um, because these were workers that were salaried under link and had this connection to work on a regular income, on a regular basis, I beg your pardon. In the case of majority of workers on our platform who are distributed workers, again, Link is not their only client. Yeah, and so if you have your workshop on Gong Road, yes, Link is giving you works and you have the option of saying yes or no to that work that Link is giving you, but you have your other clientele. So you've already built your network of clients. And so, you know, Link saying we can't give you jobs and we can't guarantee sucks, but at least you have your clients and you can continue works in that. Um, one of the things that our workers were very quick to try to find out from us was what type of support we were going to give Link. 
Yeah. So one of the things that we did was making sure that, you know, workers were educated and empowered on um, on COVID, how it spreads, how to prevent um, spread the mitigations that Nick was taking, but also that they were operating in a very safe environment, providing access to PPE, so personal protective um, equipment, but also just making sure that the workers that were at most risk for being um, victims to COVID or being susceptible to um, the economic impacts of COVID were sheltered. Yeah, so looking at opportunities to leverage partnerships um, with some of our um, some of our networks. So we are a beneficiary of the Youth Impact Labs under Mexico. And one of the things that we rolled out during that period was a cash transfer program for the most vulnerable workers on our platform. So saying, you know, we may not be able to give you work at this point in time, but, you know, at least hopefully this money will help you be able to, you know, pay your basic utilities, your basic rent and things like this. We didn't see a big shift in terms of um, workers trying to shift their trades. Again, we work across three very distinctive business lines and the crossover that we see uh, amongst those sectors is, is not very much. So we didn't see workers trying to like adapt and say, you know, I'm going to provide this service now versus this mm -hmm. service. I would say the only place that yeah. we had seen that kind of shift was in the case um, of furniture where our, um, um, our tailor started making masks as you know, kind of a reactive action to say that, you know, at least I, I may not be able to make my wide scale furniture, but I can make things that can be able sure. to sell it. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a very, you know, a vivid picture of, you know, the informal market. And I think that's where Link has been working. Um, Shiko, I, I know, you know, you've, you've been looking at the gig sector, but, you know, um, I think in your work, you've also, you know, mentioned the fact that, you know, um, you see a disruption, you know, that spans even into, you know, full-time employees. Um, and I think a recent study by Gartner, you know, highlighted that 32% of organizations will be replacing their full-time employees with contingent workers as a way to save costs. How, how do you see these trends disrupting the workforce in, you know, developing markets and, and really speaking to, you know, the broader labor force besides, you know, just informal workers? How, how do you see this, you know, panning out? Uh, th thank you so much, Kichuku, for this uh, opportunity. So, I mean, gig work, as I was mentioning when we were doing the prep for this, I feel like uh, the future of work and gig work is what I call my life's work. I've been doing this for, what, 10 years. And we need to redefine what gig work actually means now. And thank you very much, COVID, for actually accelerating that definition. Initially, when you, I mean, even earlier this year, we, we were carrying this study with my MasterCard Foundation. I reached out to a few people who I know for sure, for sure, in the in the theoretical basic definition of gig workers, they are gig workers. And I asked them, do you consider yourself as a gig worker? And they said, no, because gig the, the idea of a gig was also often looked down upon because it looked like our oh, gig is, are you the mama who are the women who clean for you? Or are you the, the person who comes, the plumber or the electrician who just comes for an hour or two? But the actual definition of a, of a gig worker is somebody who does, who does not have uh, an employment contract with the person that they're offering that service to, yeah? They're offering, lending a service on an hourly basis and they don't have any contractual agreement in terms of a longer term engagement. They're paid per hour. So anybody who's a freelancer or um, they're called freelancer or independent worker is within that bracket essentially. And what we have seen in the past, um, what is it called? In the, in, in the past uh, year of COVID is that 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 group of people is expanding. I mean, every every single week from uh, from March, you've been hearing people. We have moved remotely. I mean, like I know many startups in Kenya have moved remotely. We have seen that uh, Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, Microsoft. I mean, surprisingly, Microsoft. To be totally honest, I was very surprised by the Microsoft move. They all have announced that they have like remote work policies. The other day, I saw somebody was advertising for a remote, remote head of remote work. Uh, um, for the organization because they decided they're going to be a, re a complete remote work. What this means is that if I am a CEO and I'm running my organization and I have just cut off the cost of real estate, you know, having a building, having desk, uh, having internet, I mean, all that stuff that goes into setting up an office, I've just, just 
within a few a few months, it's gone away. That cost is gone away. And, and it's a substantial cost, to be honest. What would be the next thing saying, what, what are these people doing at home? I'm sure they're working for somebody else. Is cut off some of these um, cozy benefits that come with full-time employment and say, okay, you work for me for eight hours or six hours, you can work for whoever else for whatever remaining part of your day. And what that means is expands opportunities for especially knowledge workers. I know many engineers in our team, we have a very open policy. We are saying you work for us, but unless you can work for anybody else, provided there's no conflict of interest. And that, that opens up creativity. Now what, what, what that means is that this is what is happening. Um, it's not a freelancing as it was. It is, I know I have eight hours with this, four hours with this organization and four hours with this other organization and four hours with this other organization. And with, with that expansion means that I can work for three different organizations at the same time and, and still be very, very productive because it's the same brain and I'm transferring knowledge and skills across different organization. That changes the definition of work in itself. Yeah, we, we, we try and not, yeah. we try to say employment, we call it livelihood. It, it, it changes the whole idea of livelihoods. How we look at livelihoods becomes totally different. And you know, the way gig workers, everybody has been admiring, oh, if I work for Uber, or if I work for these people, I have my flexibility. We need to be able to fight for people now that even us who are knowledge workers, who are, who are used to eight to five, and who are used to having like an uh, asali at the end of the, month, of, of the month, that is going to change. I'll be paid every two weeks or every week or per, per milestone hit. What does that mean for my benefits or for my education benefit, for my health benefits, for my all these sure. things? It changes a lot of that because mm -hmm. the idea of livelihoods and work mm -hmm. has totally been disrupted by COVID. Absolutely, yeah. And 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 talking about livelihoods and you know disruption across board, I'd like to switch it over to Ashley. But right before I make the switch, you know, just um, reminding our audience that we'll be taking um, questions from the audience in the second half of this call. So please feel free to shoot in your questions through the chat box um, and I will be happy to segue those into our, to our panelists. Um, Ashley, um, you know, Masico has a broader portfolio um, and I think from Shiko and Akinyu, we've heard of what's happening in East Africa. Um, how does this mirror across other parts of the world? Um, I know, you know, Masico has done some work in Jordan. Um, the Middle East um, and other parts of Africa. How, 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 how have you seen this, you know, um, worker resilience and safety net um, question um, panning out in those spaces? Um, sure, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, as part of my role, I am able to see what our programs, what other um, NGOs are doing and what are some of the effects. So I think, what I'll talk about wouldn't be a surprise to you know to our, our colleagues in Kenya. I mean, it pretty much mirrors what what they said, and to other people listening. Um, but there's been a large, you know, a massive fall in demand uh, globally. That's you know clearly particularly hit certain sectors such as luxury goods, or as we just heard from Link, and we learned a lot from Link around face to face uh, face to face based services. Um, there has been expansion in some areas um, such as growth, unsurprisingly, in e-commerce, in, in transportation, logistics workers, but generally a big, big fall in demand. Um, that's made worse by many, many big workers unable to source inputs, uh, especially for younger people entering the labor market, they're unable to access training or um, where training has moved online, it's often of, of poor quality or issues around, around cost of data, infrastructure. Um, but in terms of resilience and what development organizations are thinking about, I, I think development organizations are, they tend to think more about income growth. How can we maximize income growth? And, you know, people here can think about how well they do that. Um, you know, I think in Mexico, we do, we do a good job. They tend to focus on income growth. Um, and I think they're often not aware about the various trade-offs in thinking about um, resilience as well. Uh, so resilience, you may want to focus on and training across a variety of skills or more transferable skills to people, recognizing that they'll uh, move between jobs or that's a possibility. You might think about increasing the number of networks they have or supporting them to work for multiple clients so that there's some inbuilt redundancy in, in the system. Um, so 
I, I think the Lemoy Edison aren't thinking enough about resilience. And I think I think that brings us to our discussion right now. But though, though I think generally across where we work, we're seeing a lot of these negative impacts. I think we are largely seeing that digital gig workers on digital platforms, digitally engaged gig workers are performing better than non-digitally digitally engaged ones. You know, perhaps unsurprising, but I think worth saying, and that's for some of those reasons I mentioned, that they often work through multiple pathways. So there's some redundancy about, about market access. Um, the platforms they work for, for instance, Link, others mentioned, are quite dynamic. And we've seen how they're pivoting very quickly. You know, often it's not an easy thing because there's little to do. Um, and generally a growth of people moving to online, to e-commerce, e-logistics. Um, I guess the last comment for me on this is that I think, though I think Mercy Corps among, amongst our peers, we're more focused on resilience than others. I think we probably have missed out. Our, there's a gap in our thinking around social security. Um, a lot of development organizations, us included, have responded to this crisis through with cash distribution through cash for work. Um, and I think, well, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this a bit later, but I think there's not enough consideration about other ways to support social security. Sure. Great. Yeah. And 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 I think that's interesting because, you know, from Shiko's side, you know, um, as an innovation lab, I believe, you know, you've been pioneering some of this thinking around social secu securities. Um, and social safety nets, and you know, you you recently launched um, Parks, um, the platform. Could you just tell us more about not just the platform, but really the thinking behind it, um, and you know, the opportunity that you see in the gig economy as far as social safety nets are concerned, and how innovators like yourself can step into you know, plug in this gap. Sorry, I'm sure. muted. <laughs> I just sort of spoke um, I, I just start with a bit of history in terms of like, where did this all come from? A long time ago, I, I think I mentioned this to, to, to you guys, is I, I, I built, uh, we built a platform for gig workers down in South Africa. And you could see people are getting connected to work and it's awesome. But when you talk to them in terms of like the impact part of it, like, yes, I've gotten a job, I've gotten a 100% increase in salary and stuff, or I didn't have salary, but now I have some. You ask, you look at them because the money is there, they use it for, for, for just subsistence, yeah? With, with no social protection at all. And then when we came back home uh, to Kenya, and you actually Masiko was our first investor in that, in Kibarua now. In Kibarua now, we did the same exact thing. Uh, built a platform to connect informal workers, uh, informal workers to, to, to employment. And sorry, I have a small person knocking my door down. Um, uh, so, so connecting, uh, a, informal workers to employment, very much like what Linky is doing. And then I started realizing they were getting money and you, you could see them from week one to week 12 as you're working with them. Even their continence changes because there's a bit of money with them. They look much better, they do things. But when something like a, like a, 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 a social thing happens to them, there's a death in the family, there's sickness in the family, they go back to where they were 12 weeks ago. And at actually, we, we've actually first uh, piloted the idea of social protection, just getting very small kind of insurance, 20 shillings. Um, it's called Weber Cover. It's not, uh, it's not health insurance. It's a uh, work-based insurance. So if anything happens to you on your way to work or at work or something, and you already signed up for a job, you, you're already insured so that you, you know, you're not going to lose all your money for an accident that happened because you're at work. And that one caught on because many workers are willing to give up that 30, 40 shillings to actually be able to pay for insurance per task. And then one of my co-founders co also as well was working in um, with, with freelancer who, freelancers who are, what is it called? Freelancers who are, who are what is it called? Who are, uh, who are writers, developers, designers and stuff. And all of the, the, it all came together. We realized they have the same problem. They get a lot of money. Freelancers, actually developers, designers, and writers, they get a lot of money at once. But the, when, when you tell them, are you able to buy a machine for yourself? Are you able to do this themselves? They're not able because they get money 
and use it almost instantly. So they don't have the idea of saving or of just putting a social protection net. And then when it came to COVID, we did this research within, 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 within COVID and we realized that only 6% of Kenyans actually had a savings. Forget gig workers, just general Kenyans. And then with all the job losses that happened, I'm sorry, let me just finish this point. With all the job losses that happened, there were I, I think Shiko may have frozen. Um, actually, compliments to her for breathing it out. Um, I think these are the realities of, you know, working from home and, you know, being a working mom. So, um, yeah, thanks, Shiko, for breathing it out. Um, and, yeah, um, I guess as Shiko just, you know, tries to um, resolve her situation, um, I can invite Akini to, you know, um, talk to us about, you um, about us, you know, about Link um, and the experience with Link. And, you know, Shiko was alluding to the issue around engineering products for gig workers um, and, and you know, like, you know, especially talking to the micro insurance, um, you know, the savings element and some of those. Um, are these things that you've explored at Link um, and what has been your experience looked like? And, and also maybe Akini, um, you know, when we think about COVID and looking at the fact that, you know, we could be staring into a second wave, do you feel like some of the mechanisms that um, are being put like platforms like yourself are at a place where they would blanket workers from the effects of a second wave of COVID? Mm -hmm. Or do you see this as something that may need a bit much longer as far as, you know, testing out and experimenting some of these solutions is concerned? Great question, Getuku. Um, so to kind of double back, I think Shiku hit a lot of points when it comes to social protections. The issues that we're experiencing as a platform and in engaging informal workers are issues that we've always been experiencing. I think COVID has only accelerated that, compounded that, and heightened it. So then when you talk about social protection, these are conversations we were having um, as link with our partners for a very long period of time. Um, so even to go back to Weba, so she had talked about Weba, which is essentially a work accident coverage. Link had been talking to a bunch of insurers for over a year before we were actually able to settle on an insurance provider that could provide us with Weba. Again, it's very complex when trying to find um, whether it's financial providers or insurers to ensure people in the gig space, particularly informal workers that don't have really consolidated ways for for insurers to essentially um, validate their ability to pay back, yeah? And so even in the case of Weba, this coverage took us a significant amount of time for us as a platform. And you can imagine Link has so much historical data of the workers that we work with. We're able to tell how many jobs a worker has done on our platform. What was the total value of that job? Um, what was the split in value of job based off materials, based off um, labor? Um, is the pro compliant? How many ratings the pro has? So even with a platform like Link that has all this data, we still struggled very much so to find an insurance provider to be able to say that, yes, you know, we're willing to bank on the fact that you have gig workers on your platform, that, you know, some of them may have been on your platform longer than others. You know, it's also seasonal, so you may not have the same 500 workers that you're insuring in one given month or the same 100, 500 workers that you're um, insuring in the other month. So I think these challenges are something that we've experienced very much so before COVID. They'll continue after COVID. Um, I think COVID just highlighted um, the need for urgency and expediency. And so even when I come back to social protections on the end of financing, and Tatenda is going to speak later um, on during this session, we had also struggled um, to find a financial provider to provide us with the ability to support our workers in our incubation program. So I alluded to this a little bit earlier on, but we have an apprenticeship program. The only workers that remained in our apprenticeship program are workers in our furniture and decor segment. Um, for reasons being that this was the only segment that this apprenticeship was happening fully isolated in a production facility where we had control over 
each and every element related to health and safety. Yeah? So we could do temperature checks. We can make sure workers um, that were sick were sent home. Um, we can make sure that you know we're, no one else is accessing the workshop. So again, this is the only apprenticeship program um, that we were able to keep open during this period of time. Um, but again, as part of this incubation program, the goal is to make sure that all apprentices are actually graduating, but graduating to what? Yeah, the goal of this apprenticeship program, again, is to graduate uh, business owners. And so trying to find a financer to provide us um, with the ability to, you know, support workers, get their own workshop space, have the tools and materials that they need, have additional support in terms of additional helpers was exceptionally hard. Um, when we finally met Imalipe, I feel like they're God sent. Um, when we finally met Imalipe, it was quite a seamless process and their understanding of the complexities of working with gig workers, but also their flexibility to understand how we needed to navigate, for instance, um, credit reliability. Yeah, can we use M-Pesa statements versus traditional receipts in the case where, you know, a tool is being bought from an informal market? Like, how do you validate that the loan that you gave was used to buy that tool if cash is being exchanged versus M-Pesa? You know, so that flexibility in terms of financing has been something that has been incredible for Link, especially now during a pandemic season where a lot of workers are struggling to find work, but also have their own career and growth plans. So I'd say as, as, far as, it come, as far as it comes to safety nets, those are the things that we have been looking at before yeah. COVID, during COVID and after. Um, in terms of these measures that we've taken, so I, I would definitely say, I would summarize the kind of safety nets into three. Number one, partnerships, and I've already mentioned this um, through HICRIS. Um, um, I've already mentioned this through things like Imanipay and the cash transfer program through Mexico. Um, a, an additional partnership that we explored during this time to try to make sure that workers were engaged. Um, we joined hands with the Safe Hands Kenya Coalition and we were the implementing partner for distributing public disinfection services to low income and informal mm -hmm. settlements. So again, we were engaging um, over 300 community workers. We were able to train over 50 um, community leaders, sensitize them and make sure that they're able to train um, other community members transfer over a million shillings to them, you know, worker conditions, which I've already talked about, and then information sharing, which is really, really important. In terms okay. of this second Great. wave, sorry, just to in terms of this second wave, and Shiko had alluded to this um, previously, it's not really a second wave of COVID. We feel like we are much more prepared for it now, but social protections are really important. But even before social protections, majority of workers are very, very, um, very cognizant about the fact that they need to put food on the table. So if we cannot okay. address this okay. first question of how we give work, then it becomes impossible mm -hmm. to um, have different conversations about social protections. Okay. Okay, great. I'll transition to questions from the audience. And once again, um, you have the opportunity to ask our panelists questions. I can see one coming in from Chris McClay. Um, and the question is, do gig workers, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll front this que question to you, Shiko, um, especially because I know, you know you're thinking around safety net products targeting gig workers. Um, and, and again, you know, once again, Shiko, <laughs> We do understand your situation, and you know, uh, thank you so much for braving it on, and you know, still um, being with us for the session. Um, I know it's tough, you know, being being a working mom, uh, but thank you so much. Um, yeah, so so this question uh, will go to you, Shiko. Um, so Chris ask, is asking, do gig workers in Africa value those relevant benefits? That's insurance, healthcare, um, you know, things like um, wellness, etc or do they prioritize upfront cash? So, you know, he, he's asking, is it a challenge for platforms to assign part of the cash to insurance benefits when the users might not value it as much? Yeah, so, so you know, having spent some time researching on this, Shiko, and even structuring products to this, um, what's, what's your perspective as far as the workers' appreciation of these safety nets is concerned? So I, I think, first of all, we need to first do control, alt, delete, and reformat our, our, our thinking on what um, insurance, the way we think about insurance, and the way we think about social protection net. Because they are, these gig workers are already doing it. They're already saving. A 
for my turn, the one who's challenged, yeah, I think I'm also experiencing a challenge um, hearing her. Shiko, I think we may have lost you, um, if you can hear us. Okay, um, Paula for the tech challenges. Um, yeah, um, Shiko. Okay, yeah, I, I think we lost her. Maybe as we wait for her to reconnect, um, Ashley's, oh, Shiko, I think you're back, you're on mute. So you my dropped came back. No, it's my power that came back and changed <laughs> my connection. So what happens? No, to worry, yeah. let's brave it on. <laughs> so I, I, I was saying that we need to first do auto auto delete over just report our brains on just how we approach in uh, social safety nets for for gig workers and I, I talk about gig workers in terms of like formal and informal workers you know and skilled and unskilled workers because people apart from like the the more we, we have three buckets of, of of gig workers that we are working on we have the informal unskilled workers we have the uh, informal skilled workers and then we have the um, skilled informal workers and when you look at those buckets they look at insurance very very differently you'll be surprised that informal and skilled workers actually have such huge discipline around how they handle their money yeah it's little money and yes if anything happens to destabilize them the, uh, financially they, they slip back to like zero money but they already have a discipline of saving 50 shillings 100 shillings here every single day. So uh, one of our researchers, we, we did research like in Kiambu and Nyeri just to say we, we, we have done research outside Nairobi to just understand what's the st state of gig work even outside Nairobi. And we're not limiting ourselves to people who use platforms. So we're not limiting ourselves to people who use Flink or, or these platforms. You're saying anybody who does a daily, daily work and is daily wage paid is somebody that we should consider for this. And they have something called Karimu. I didn't know what, to, what that means, I think what? And it is like a small savings tin. It's like a piggy bank where they put 50 to 100 shillings every day. The sad thing is they don't gain interest, but they say, you know, that money, I keep it and I forget about it. Every day I have a commitment to myself to save these 100 shillings such that when something happens, I'll go and open it up and it will save me. And they have good examples of my child broke their leg and we got that money from Karimo. They have all these like examples of what they're doing in a very disciplined way, yeah? The, the informal uh, skilled workers also have, have like a, a similar way of doing it. They get some money, they put it on, a, on, a, on, on in a, not in, in a chama, yeah? Like savings groups. They, they are very disciplined in the, in the savings group, both male and female, yeah? They, they're constantly saving, constantly saving. And then we have the, the skilled gig workers. Those ones are the ones that are a bit worrying because they get a lot of money and most of them have not gotten the discipline because they, they, they know they will get a lot of money on day X. They don't have the discipline of saying, I'm going to save part of this, apart from a few exceptional ones. So how do you get them to get that discipline of payment? So it is, it is so the, the two, the first two buckets actually have the discipline. They don't want upfront cash. If you can say, I'm, give, I'm giving you my mind, my, my my money, I'm going to give you my money, you keep it for me, and I can cash it out. And that's why you're saying we have to redefine what the, the idea of insurance is. Because if you're going to say, I'm going to give you my money, and you can only check it out as insurance, then you're going to lose a lot of these people who keep it away as a, as a savings quote and quote. What they want to know is, if I can go to hospital and get and get and get treated or my child get treated, but at the same time, I'm not going to lose this money if I don't get sick the whole year, then you have like a winning combination. And that's, that's what, what, what one of our uh, service providers is actually doing that for us is how do we create a financial product that is both a savings and insurance product at the same time? Because that's what they win. Because they don't, when you talk to them is, um, you're betting against God when you take insurance, you're doing this against, uh, what if I don't get sick? They don't understand what the, 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 the risk of taking an insurance. They don't understand that the idea that, you're, you're taking in case you get sick. They're saying, what if I don't get sick? So I lose all my money. So how do you bring them in by making sure that it's a savings product at the same time? That's number one. Yeah. Number two is being able to, to, to prioritize for them. So the biggest thing that hit our face is we weren't thinking we we're going to get health insurance as a topmost uh, ask. Many, many of our, of our, of, of our research uh, respondents, primarily women said, I'll cut my leg to get my child to school. So education cover is actually the highest thing that they save for. 
Yeah. So if you're going to talk about insurance, we, we, we are, you, you, in terms of prioritization, education comes first, then health cover comes second. Yeah. Then savings are some sort of saving that gets some interest that is better than their chama is third. So that is, but, but it's just about rejigging what we think about insurance and what we think about our approach to gig workers. The, 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 the more affluent gig workers who we are, we are working on separately, then they just want to be able to be able to access, access their tools and gadgets, be able to access a life that they will ac access if they worked for full-time employment. That is what, what we, are, we are looking yeah. into. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. I mean, very interesting insight there to hear that you know, like education is such a priority um, for these workers, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis health and savings. Um, and I think that really speaks to you know the question around product development and thinking about you know which are the most um, relevant products to these workers. And I think this will be an interesting point to you know uh, rope in. Um, Tatenda from Imali. Um, Imali is a platform that's developing, um, you know, financial products for workers. And, um, you know, in a, in a quick two, three minutes, uh, Tatenda, it will be interesting to hear, you know, um, around, you know, the ideas behind structuring, you know, financial products that can drive resilience for workers. And I'll tie that to a question that's coming from um, Jerry of Moura around is the data generated by platforms sufficient for finance and insurance solution providers to develop products. So you can speak to the, the issue around product development and really also around um, how, you know, the data generated by these platforms, um, you know, facilitates that process. On to you, Tatanda. Good morning, thanks, Kuchuku. Good morning, everyone. Um, there's my face there and I'll remove the video briefly. Yes, so so Gutuku, we we are in Mali Pay. We're a sector agnostic um, financial services and health platform tailored for gig workers across Africa. We are present in Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa. And when we say sector agnostic, we are catering to deepen financial inclusion, improve safety nets, and provide productive finance to gig workers on the continent today. So to give you two examples of the work we're doing and the impact we're seeing on the ground is in Nigeria, where we've partnered with Safe Border Nigeria where we have um, hundreds of border riders today who are saving with us uh, minimum about $2 to $4 a week and also accessing productive finance tools for their day-to-day -day work. This includes bike parts on credit, smartphones on credit, and fuel on credit. In the time frame we've worked with Safe Border Nigeria, we've seen almost a 99% increase in productivity, which ties into your statement around financial resilience. Earning more income over time actually creates a buffer um, and the ability for gig workers to have more flexibility in how they use their money, right? So one of our most popular services is fuel on credit, bike parts on credit, right? And prior to Pay, these bike riders would have almost three days downtime in a month, right? They were offline for one reason or the other. Um, bike is not working, smartphone is broken, et cetera. They are now working an additional three to five days a month, which if you equate that over 12 months is almost 45 to 60 days of extra income in a year. Also, as Shiko, <clears throat> excuse me, was discussing around insurance and how people would like to use their savings towards it, we're seeing trends where the riders they are requesting access uh, for savings to pay for school fees, for rent, and of course, medical bills as well. So we're seeing quite a lot of insights and feedback from our initial launch in Nigeria. In Kenya with, with Link, we've been able to provide productive finance to their carpenters in the incubation program. We spend a lot of time engaging with them, understanding their needs in terms of where and how are they struggling for working, working capital finance. Of course, Link has very strong algorithms and data that we basically fine tune to choose some of the top carpenters um, who would want to put into our program as we pilot and launch with them in, in Kenya. However, we also have a view that we want to layer on other additional services that actually improve the resilience and improve the impact and also the income they make over time. So fundamentally, we all want to make more money over time, whether you're an employee in an office or a freelancer or a self-employed individual, we believe generating more income over time is fundamentally where geek workers should be, right? So year on year, I'm increasing my income and I'm growing my business. So that's Great, really, thank you. and that's a rundown of our two major. 
Great. Um, thank you so much, Tatenda, for giving us that, you know, um, overview around, you know, structuring of this product. I do acknowledge that, you know, we are um, almost coming to the close of um, the time we had for this session. And really to thank um, everyone so much um, and, you know, um, a lot of um, gratitude to all the panelists uh, for sparing the time to talk to us today. Uh, particularly Shiko, I think you've been the MVP for today for braving it out, um, you know, regardless of your internet situation um, and the situation with your, with your young one. Um, yeah, but really, you know, this is a, you know, it's a great conversation for, for us to have. And uh, just to say that this shouldn't end here, I've just shared the links uh, to all the organizations uh, that were represented in this session. And please take um, some time to interact um, with these platforms, but also, you know, in case you do want to, you know, continue this conversation, um, then I think reaching out to, you know, uh, members of the panel and also some of the other um, members represented here will be um, a good point, you know, to for us to further this conversation going forward. So yeah, so thank you everyone, and a big thank you to the organizers of this session. That's um, um, Sankalp through IntelliCup uh, for putting together such a great event. And we do hope that this is a conversation that we will sustain um, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, in the coming years to ensure that, um, you know, we're building a resilient uh, gig work um, ecosystem, uh, particularly in developing countries where we do see um, that additionality, that transformational opportunity and that impact opportunity being uh, most relevant. So thank you so much, everyone, um, and enjoy the rest of your day uh, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you so much and goodbye.